Hi, my name is Juan Pablo Ruiz. I'm a postdoc at UW-Madison. Hi, I'm Sarah Shabat Hokanson. I'm Assistant Provost of Professional Development and Postdoctoral Affairs at Boston University. Hi, I'm Rob Brown. I'm the Director of Social Justice Education at Northwestern University. Hi, I'm Sina Safai, Director of Career Development and Industry Outreach at Rush University Graduate College. So, shall we start? Let's dig in. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess what struck me about the gender bias paper, and of course I'm coming from the perspective of being female in STEM, is my scientific research was at the nexus of chemistry and biology. And so when I was in a PhD program that was more biologically focused, I didn't think about being female at all. And I, I didn't really notice a difference because in my class year, six out of the eight students were female. Right. Um, but when I was a chemistry undergraduate and a chemistry postdoc, it was entirely the opposite. I felt like a woman in STEM. And so even things like the departmental seminar series or the, for postdocs, you know, we as women would joke like, oh, it's the, the female postdoc <laughs> slot. Like, you know, because there would be this huge rotation and then all of a sudden we would get the ping of like, oh, would you like to speak? And it's like, oh yes, okay. And, and so it's interesting because in those moments, I'm both grateful for the intentionality of thinking about diversity of speakers and perspectives and also not wanting to be the female slot. And that intentionality is so important, right? I think especially when we're talking about microaggressions in our experiences as minorities, you know, along whatever axis that may be, you know, because like, like you were saying, there's some people who will say well-meaningly, or they'll, they'll, they think that they're well-meaning, they will say, oh, I don't see gender, or I don't see color, right? And then when you realize that that kind of whitewashing and, you know, just erasing of that really leads to a propagation of the inequalities, whereas what you're talking about is also not wanting to be like that token minority, right, that's invited to speak just because you are, you know, the Latinx, uh, you know, postdoc or the woman postdoc. And I think that, that that piece definitely plays a role in that tension is definitely something I've noticed too. Yeah, and it's a quite like simple and complex tension of how do we create opportunities for people to be who they are as individuals and live within their full um, humanity, mm -hmm. right, um, across the broadness of their identities and how that um, impacts their lived experience. And, you know, you would think that would be simple, that right? you can kind of just treat each person um, as you might want to, um, as they might want to be treated, but there's so much complexity um, across individual groups and even within groups that I think as we start to dig into these articles, they highlight some of those complexities that right. make it, I think, difficult for us to understand and comprehend um, sometimes. One of the questions I had was like, the names, what, what was the ratio of like white names and like non-white mm. names? Because if you have a like black female name and you have a, a like a white female name, based on studies, there, there, there will be like different outcomes when you, your resume gets evaluated. When you have an international name, mm -hmm. Muhammad, is it worse than mm -hmm. being like a, a female um, with American name? So intersectionality, I think, is, some, is something that we tend to forget. Right, and I think that's what Rob was, what was, um, what you yeah, were speaking to Rob so. about, you know, all those different intersections of, you know, whether it's gender, whether it's race, a lot of times religion plays into it as well. Mm -hmm. And I think when we get into, you know, even like the, the you know, with microaggressions um, or outward aggressions, right, the climate and, and, you know, the world that we live in at a particular time and place also becomes really important as to how folks are feeling, right, and how folks are reacting to particular situations, comments that make them feel more or less inclusive. Um, and I think for me, the biggest piece or one of the things that comes out of the, the gender bias paper in particular is even as scientists, you know, we, we, we claim to be completely objective in looking at the data, right? But we come into, we read the abstract and we're already coming into the paper with our biases, right? And it's like, oh, this, this either agrees with my worldview or doesn't. And so then now I'm going to either be overly critical of the paper or not so critical of the paper, right? And even just recognizing that I am a human being, therefore I am biased, right? Is such an important step Very in that important, process. Yeah. I feel like it's one of the um, first steps mm -hmm. in the process, right? It's mm -hmm. hard to um, get into a conversation that you're already skeptical of having. Right. Um, and when I talk to um, folks about microaggressions, I often describe myself as uh, someone who microaggresses and someone who is microaggressed, right? Mm. And 
how we can start thinking about the multiple identities that we hold and that, you know, we um, have been socialized in a particular way that maybe has us uh, validating, um, believing um, some types of microaggression, some type of biases, and then pushing back mm -hmm. and invalidating or um, be being held in disbelief around others, right? And, um, you know, and kind of the point that you raise, I often ask the, the question of, you know, why do we hold these issues in contention with one another? Mm. Um, and how can we start to move in a direction that starts seeing patterns and overlapping mm. um, forms of bias that, that, that um, play out? Because they can have a compounding impact um, when they show up in tandem. Yeah. Well, and what, I mean, one thing that struck me when you talked about intersectionality is all the identities we can't see. Mm -hmm. So I, I think whether it's, you know, disabled versus abled or, or whether it's thinking about someone's socioeconomic status, you know, they may feel microaggressions all the time in some of these <coughs> ivory tower, um, mm -hmm. primarily white institutions, just mm -hmm. simply based on their background and how they grew up and what yeah. they're familiar with or not familiar with. And yet, for for many of us, we're fluent in it, and I mm -hmm. and so I I think sometimes it's it's easier to be intentional about some of the identities that were talked about, you know, particularly in the gender bias paper because they're visible in a yeah. lot of cases. But there are lots of ways in which microaggressions happen, and it can be hard to speak up because it might not even be something that you want to share, that you want right. to reveal, and yet it's so inherent to who you are and um, and what you experience. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think there's that that tension, right? I think particularly not just along the axis of international or not, but there is, you know, Sarah, as you mentioned, like, you know, the, the culture of academia, the ivory tower culture of academia falls along certain axes of privilege, right? And the question of, as you mentioned, how much uh, of it is granting spaces towards learning and, you know, allowing assimilation, integration, and inclusion, and how much of inclusion is actually challenging our own biases, stereotypes, you know, the culture of academia as a whole, and say we need to push actually for change because inclusivity actually doesn't necessarily lie with, you know, folks coming in and assimilating, but rather us, you know, creating a culture of excellence around inclusivity and around allowing everyone to be their, their full selves, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think it uh, makes me, th that makes me think about uh, the dynamics of how often we um, welcome individuals to our campus uh, who come from a, variety, a wide variety of backgrounds and um, lived experiences. And, you know, we formulated this definition of inclusion as how do we help folks um, behave, act, perform, study, um, research in the ways in which we do all those things, right? Mm -hmm. um, versus really acknowledging, centering their ways of being, knowing, living um, as valid, right? And not only as valid, but as additive, um, mm -hmm. as something that's adding more richness um, to the ways in which we're operating. And, and that requires, kind of as you mentioned, change. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes I think we, we struggle um, as that change comes up um, because it creates cognitive dissonance for us mm -hmm. in many times. And so when I saw the, the, the gender bias article, you know, I thought about kind of my own reaction to that um, as a man, right? Mm -hmm. So as a man, how did I start to the process of learning about gender and learning about gendered experiences? Mm -hmm. um, because I didn't necessarily have to all the time throughout my life. Right. I kind of got a, a pass, right, based on right. patterns of, of right. power and privilege. And as I started getting some examples from um, women colleagues or trans colleagues, uh, the many ways that they experience um, bias or marginalization or harassment, you know, um, at worst, uh, I found myself often in disbelief, similar mm -hmm. to um, folks in the study. <laughs> like, right. not, not, no way, right? <laughs> no way that could happen. Um, not here, right. not at this right. type That's of in institution. And I really had to do some deep critical self-reflection to start finding ways to suspend that disbelief mm -hmm. and continually come back and ask myself the question, what would it mean if this were true? Right? Yeah. What would my responsibility be if this were true? And how do I start operating and living from that place versus wanting to believe that it doesn't? Right. Uh, which just reified my own power and privilege in many ways. Mm -hmm.